O oh, our mother the earth, O oh, our father the sky, your children are we, and with our tired backs we bring you the gifts that you love. So weave for us a garment of brightness. May the warp be the white light of morning. May the weft be the red light of evening. May the border be the standing rainbow. May the fringes be the falling rain. So weave for us a garment of brightness. That we may walk fittingly where birds sing that we may walk fittingly where grass is green. O oh, our mother the earth, O oh, our father the sky. My title today is High Speech, although it could perhaps more accurately be called Heightened Speech. It's not about what you say when you're high, although it could be. It's more to do with the kinds of speech that can uplift the listener. So, poetry, prayer, prophecy, spells, incantations, blessings, even rants. It's what happens when you cast a spell over your listeners. It's kind of creating a light trance so that people are taken on a journey, taken into another world where their consciousness, if you like, is somehow enhanced purely by the words spoken. Now this is a huge subject. It could be a whole conference on it. It ranges from the Pitinjara elders sitting cross-legged in the desert rattling their boomerangs and chanting ancient songs from the dream time to Kate Tempest rousing the audience at Glastonbury just last weekend. Often this kind of speaking is not ordinary. It's unusual. Maybe the words are archaic. There's a kind of a, um, a formality about them. But, as I say, it has the effect of uplifting the audience and indeed it often takes place in a ritual context. The context can be very important. Here in a lecture theater, it's very different from the context of sitting around a fire in a roundhouse, for example. But this context can, if the audience, if the listeners are in the right frame of mind, have the effect of evoking a sense of wonder, maybe even bringing them into kind of a rapturous state. As you will have noticed from some of the examples I mentioned, po uh, prayer, prophecy, blessing, incantation, preaching even, these are often associated with religious or spiritual contexts. And so they have the effect, they can have the effect of bringing about a communion with the sacred. Nowadays, of course, we are immersed in the world of text and imagery. But our ancestors lived very much in the moment. They lived in the elements. They lived in memory and they passed on their knowledge through oral tradition. And so it's there in that oral tradition of our ancestors that heightened speech achieved perhaps its zenith. And today I'm going to give you some examples. That example to begin with, by the way, was, was a Native American prayer. But I'm going to give you mainly examples from what I know a little bit about, and that is the story, <coughs> prophecy, and poetry of ancient Britain. 
as passed down through Welsh mythology. We hear a lot about the traditions of other countries when we are seeking this kind of this wisdom, this ancient wisdom. But for me, exploring the stories and the landscape of, of Britain has been the greatest sort of source of this knowledge. Now, um, storytelling. I'm going to start with storytelling. There are certain points in a story where there will be a sort of a shift of gear and perhaps, for example, at a, at a, um, where something new is beginning, is beginning in a story, there'll be a, a, an elaborate descriptive passage, maybe followed by a rhetorical run. So that's what I'm going to... I'm going to start with the, um, the story from the Mabinogion, which is known as Killoch and Olwyn. Do we have any more water? Oh, that's good. Thank you. So, Kiluch has been cursed by his stepmother to marry no other woman but Olwyn, daughter of Uspavadan, the chief giant. His father suggests that he go to seek help from his cousin, none other than Arthur himself. This is the earliest story in which Arthur appears. It was the story in which Arthur was launched into world literature. So there's a wonderful passage describing Kiluch on his way to Arthur's court. Kiluch rode on a fine grey steed, with sturdy shoulders and hooves like shells. His bit was of gold, its saddle was inlaid with gold. In one hand he carried a silver spear, in other a great battle axe so sharp it could draw blood from the wind. And on his thigh he carried a golden sword that glinted in the morning sunlight. Around his shoulder he wore a red cloak. From each corner of that cloak hung an apple of red gold. Each apple was worth one hundred cows. And as he made his way to Arthur's court, his two white greyhounds crisscrossed from one side of his horse to the other as four clods of earth from his horse's hooves flew about his ears like swallows. And as he rode on his way to Arthur's court, not one strand of his hair moved, so light was the trotting of his horse. So there we have a picture, a picture painted in the mind's eye of this gilded youth floating across the land and this wonderful, almost like Celtic knotwork of the two greyhounds crisscrossing from one side to the other as the four clods of earth flew around his ears like swallows. Horses and birds often appear in mythology as linked. It's said that horses fly across the earth whilst birds gallop through the air. So this is a wonderfully elaborate descriptive passage that gets you into the story, gets you into the world, takes you into that place. Now, when Killoch arrives at Arthur's court, we have this wonderful sort of rhetorical run. As Killoch arrived at Arthur's court, he called out, Is there a gatekeeper there? Aye, there is. Clare Lewitt of the Mighty Grasp is my name, and may you lose your head for asking. Open the gate. I will not, said Clare Lewitt. Why not, said Killoch. Knife is in the meat, drink is in the horn, and no man may enter now unless he is the son of a true king. You may have wine and peppered chops and fine entertainment, but you wait, may not enter until tomorrow. If you do not let me in, said Killoch, I will let out such a cry. It will be heard in the Penwith Peninsula in Cornwall, in Dinsol in the far north, and the cold ridge of Ireland. And what is more, every woman who hears it will be so frightened she will fall barren and never bear children again. That's not a bad curse, is it, when you think of it? I mean, what a cry. It's going to create infertility and barrenness in the whole land. So, 
Glenn Lewid knew he had to act on this, so he scuttled into Arthur and he said to Arthur that, in all my life, he said, I've never seen a youth standing out, the, the, I've never seen a man so handsome as the youth standing outside your gate right now. Well, if you walked in, said Arthur, you better run back. I want to see this man. So that's how the story begins. They eventually, <coughs> Arthur gives Killoch some of his finest warriors to seek Olwyn. They find Aspadadan, the chief giant, because it's been foretold that if, he, if his daughter is to marry, he will die, he puts these impossible conditions on the wedding. One of which is to find the scissors and the razor and the comb, the only scissors and the razor and the comb in the land strong enough to cut his hair and shave his beard, who, which are to be found between the ears of Turtwith, the most savage boar in the land. There's only one horse that is fast enough to ride, catch up with that boar, and that is the white horse with the dark mane. And there's only one man that can ride that horse, and that is Mabon, son of Modron. And Mabon, son of Modron, was taken from between his mother and the wall when he was only three days old, and no one knows if he's dead or alive. So they have to find Mabon. Mabon, son of Modron, by the way, means the great son of the great mother. And there's a whole talk we could do on what that might mean. However, the process of finding Mabon in itself is something like an incantation. So, Gurir, the interpreter of the tongues, came with his companions to the blackbird of Kilguri. Arthur had said they would have to ask the ancient animals to find Mabon. And Guri said, we are the messengers of Arthur, seeking Mabon, son of Modron. Have you ever heard of him? And the blackbird said, I am old, very old. <laughs> When I was young, there was a great iron anvil here, and every night I would wipe my beak on that anvil, and now that anvil is no bigger than a nut. Can you imagine a blackbird wiping his beak on an anvil, how long it would take to wear it down to the size of a nut? But in all that time, he said, never have I heard of the man you seek. But there is one older than I, and that is the stag of Redundry. Go to speak to the stag. So they go to the stag. The stag doesn't know, but he sends them to the owl. The owl doesn't know, but he sends them to the eagle. And the eagle says, when asked if he knows, I am old, very old. When I was young, there was a great rocky crag here, and every night I would stand on that crag and peck at the stars. Now that crag is no bigger than a fist. But in all that time, he said, never have I heard of the man you seek. But. There was one time, I went to the pool at Llyn Llyw and I saw there a great fish, a huge salmon it was. I thought it would feed me for many days. I flew down and sank my talons into the back of the fish, but the fish pulled me under the water. It was all I could do to escape. Later I went to summon my kinsmen to make war on that salmon, but the salmon offered us only peace. If the salmon doesn't know about the man you seek, I don't know who will. And of course, the salmon did know about Mabon. And with the help of Arthur's warriors, Mabon was set free. And then, as he was fated to do, he rode on the white horse with the dark mane. Some say this is symbolic of the goddess herself. And he overcame came the forces of darkness in the form of Turtwit, the most savage boar, and Uspadadan, the chief giant. And he released Olwen from her captivity. And Olwen, because flowers sprang up in her footprints wherever she walked, could be th seen as the spirit of spring. So Mabon, son of Modron, riding with the goddess, overcame the forces of darkness and release the spirit of spring. Sounds like this could have been some kind of uh, ancient ritual back a long time ago. This story of how the spirit of spring was released by Mabon in conjunction with the goddess. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> now, um, hmm. okay. 
So there are many, there are a couple of other stories from Welsh mythology that I'd like to just touch on. And I've only got 10 minutes apparently, so I'll have to be, I'll have to just cut to the chase. And one of them is the story of, of, of the young Merlin and how he makes this appearance in uh, uh, Dinas Emrys, this, this, uh, this sacred omphalos in North Wales beneath the, the mighty summit of Snowdon, where Vortigen, the usurper king, was trying to build a tower. It kept collapsing to the ground. He was told he must seek a fatherless boy. The fatherless boy was found, turned out to be the young Merlin. And he said, the reason your walls are collapsing is because there are dragons below. So the dragons were released and flew off in a fury. And Merlin, the young Merlin, just a lad, kind of infused by this dragon energy, made this prophecy. A prophecy that still rings true to this very day. Now... In the original, it was long and complicated, and some of the symbolism is quite obscure to us now. I have taken the liberty of, of shaping it a little, although the words I'm using are nearly all from that original prophecy. I'm going to give you a little taste of it. Though the goddess be forgotten, the soil will become fruitful beyond man's need. The fatted boar will proffer food and drink. The hedgehog will hide its apples in London. Underground passages will be built beneath the city. Stones will speak, the sea to France will shrink, and the secrets of the deep will be revealed. But beware the ass of complacency, swift against goldsmiths, slow against ravenous wolves. Oak trees shall burn and acorns grow on lime trees. The Severn River will flow out through seven mouths, Fish will die in the heat, and from them serpents will be born, and the health-giving waters at Bath shall breed death. But root and branch will change places, and the newness of the thing shall seem a miracle. The healing maiden will return, her footsteps bursting into flame. She'll weep tears of compassion for the people of the land, dry up polluted rivers with her breath, carry the city in her right hand, the forest in her left, and nourish the creatures of the deep. With her blessing, man will become like God, waking as if from a dream, heart open, filled with light, radiant face glowing like the rising sun, shining eyes like twin silver moons, Radiant ears shimmering with song, shining lips that dance over words, words of magic that burst into the air, becoming swallows. The soul shall walk out, the mind of fire shall burn, and in the twinkling of an eye, the dust of the ancients shall be restored. It's tempting to understand that, to unpack the meaning. But rather, I'd like to let it hang there and just see how it made you feel. What is that? Healing maiden will return her footsteps bursting into flame. That passage, does that resonate with you at all now, still to this day? Yes. Knowing that this prophecy was written down 600 years ago, but supposedly spoken by Merlin, 900 years ago, supposedly spoken by Merlin 600 years before that, it gives it a certain aura. And whether there was one Merlin or many Merlins, we know that the figure with this name has been, is there, in, resides in the collective unconscious of these islands, whether he was the high priest of this land, whether he certainly is associated with the building of Stonehenge and with the coming of the greatest of all legendary kings, Arthur. So he is a significant figure in this land's mythology. Now, um, in the last three minutes, have I got <laughs> five minutes? Six minutes? Six minutes, great. <laughs> um, I'd like to mention one last demigod of Britain. Some of you probably will know him. He's beloved of the druids of this land. And that is the figure uh, who is associated with the three drops of inspiration. And perhaps this, of all the traditional 
characters in British mythology is the only instance that I know of, at least, where there's been some sort of taking of, 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 uh, of a substance which has altered the state of consciousness. It's about the, uh, the boy who was born, his mother, his, 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 well, just to, again, cut to the end of the story, really, some of you will know it, but Keridwen wants to create a, a, a spell uh, uh, um, of inspiration. Uh, for her son, who's, who's a misshapen fool, and, and, but she employs an old blind man who has as his helper, Guillaume Bach, who's the one who does all the work. And at the end of a year and a day, three drops of inspiration fly out of the cauldron, land on his finger. To cool his scorched finger, he places it in his mouth, swallows the three drops down. At that moment, a change comes over him. He blinks and looks, and though the sun is already rising, he seizes the shadows of the stars and knows their names. He looks out into the fields, and the flowers are nodding at him like old friends, but he knows Keridwen is going to be after him. So he tears off down the mountainside, the cauldron cracks behind him, and there follows this series of transformations. He turns into a hare to escape Keridwen, but she becomes a hound and becomes ever closer. He turns into a salmon to escape her. She turns into an otter and draws ever closer. He turns into a, a bird, like a dove, to escape her, but she becomes a hawk and draws ever closer. Finally, he turns himself into a single grain of wheat, but she becomes a hen and scratches and pecks him up, swallows him down whole. She turns her back, herself back into herself, but sometime later, realize that she's going to have a child. Nine months later, she gives birth this beautiful boy, put him, wraps him into a, into a, a leather bag, because she can't, she knows it's Guillaume Bach, reborn, and she doesn't want to have anything to do with him. She puts him out onto the sea, and he's washed back and forth in the waters of the world. Eventually, he's caught, found by Elfin, who thinks he might have got some treasure, he opens the bag and out steps this young boy with light shining from his brow. And he begins to speak. Elfin is amazed. He says, shining brow, taliesin. Taliesin it is, says the young boy. And then a little later when he is introduced to his Elfin's father, Gwydno, Elfin says, but you're so little, how can you speak? I'm better able to speak than you are to listen to, to, to question me. In that case, you better speak, he said. And this is an example of his early poetry, which perhaps is an example of heightened speech spoken in a state of being high. I am Taliesin. I make poetry a perfect meter and rhyme that will last until the end of the world. I know why breath is black, why silver gleams, why liver is bloody. I know why a cow has horns, why milk is white, why a, a woman is affectionate. I know why holly is green with berries red, why cow parsley is hollow, why a kid is bearded, why the cuckoos complain where the cuckoos of summer are in winter. I know what beasts there are at the bottom of the sea. I know how many drops in a shower, how many spears in a battle. I know why a fish has scales, why a white swan has black feet. I have been a blue salmon. I have been a dog, a stag, a roebuck on the mountain, a stock, a spade, an axe in the hand, a stallion, a bull, a buck. A grain of wheat I grew on the hill. I was reaped and placed in an oven. I fell to the ground as I was being roasted. A black hen swallowed me. For nine nights I was in her crop. I have been dead. I have been alive. I am Taliesin. This kind of poetry is called I am poetry. And it seems to take us beyond the memory of a single lifetime. And those of you who've experienced psychedelics will probably recognize that, recognize that 
feeling of knowing things and having been things that you didn't realize you'd been. It's, a, it's an example, as I say, of, of, of heightened speech produced as a result of taking this concoction, this medicine that we unfortunately don't know the recipe for anymore, although I think the Seed Sisters are doing a good job on finding it. It's also called this state of our, it's called Arwen, the state of inspiration, and it would seem that it's, it's been the aspiration of all the Welsh poets and indeed Welsh tradition as a whole and perhaps even ancient British tradition to achieve this state of being, this state of Arwen, this state of being inspired, which leads to the possibility of speaking high speech. Thank you.